Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, I would like to inform all participants that today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. All participants will remain on a listen-only mode for the duration of the call until the question and answer session. At that time, if you would like to ask a question, you may do so by pressing star and one. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Erlene Dowell. You may begin. Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to Lisa Glover-West from the U.S. Census Bureau for hosting this LED webinar. In light of the recent transition to 100% telework, we are utilizing technology off-site to continue operations. We aim to minimize interruptions as much as possible, but we appreciate your patience if we experience any technical delays. Please utilize the chat feature to notify us if issues should, in, should any issues arise and we will do our best to address them. All webinars and Q&A sessions are recorded and will be accessible from the Census Academy's webinars tab once the recording and transcripts are available. Please go to www.census.gov academy. And thank you for your continued support of our outreach and education efforts. On behalf of the U.S. Census Bureau and the Local Employment Dynamics Partnership, in collaboration with the Council for Community and Economic Research and the Labor Market Information Office, welcome to the May LED webinar. It is my great pleasure to introduce Erica McIntockmer as she presents statistics of Army veterans transitioning into the civilian labor market. The Veteran Employment Outcomes, or VEO, recently released our new Census Bureau experimental statistics on transitions of Army veterans into the civilian labor market. VEO data provides employment outcomes for recent cohorts of military veterans by military occupation and other veteran characteristics. These data are generated by linking Army administrative data with the national database of jobs to obtain longitudinal employment and earnings for veterans existing in the Army between 2000 and 2015. Erica McIntoffer is the Head of Research for the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Program at the Center for Economic Studies at the U.S. Census Bureau. She leads a research team that is developing new statistical measures on worker or firm dynamics from linked employer to employee data for the U.S. Her own research uses this data to study the dynamics of worker reallocation and declining job mobility in the United States. Much of this research led to the development of the job-to-job -job flows. She received her PhD in economics from Virginia Tech in 2002. With that, I welcome Erica. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased uh, to have the opportunity to um, show you this data um, that we've been working on uh, developing with the U.S. Army over the last year and a half. Um, so I'm going to start by briefly outlining uh, the goals for today's webinar. I'm going to start by providing a background on this project, how it got started, and um, uh, what we were trying to accomplish with this new set of statistics. Um, then I'm going to walk through some specific use cases of how you can use the data. And um, I'm going to do that with some, by sharing some screenshots from uh, a uh, Veteran Employment Outcomes Explorer tool that's re also released with the data. And then I'm going to conclude uh, the talk by um, uh, 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 talking about our future plans and uh, segue into discussion and Q&A. And for that Q&A, I'm going to pull up the uh, VEO Explorer tool itself um, and Many of the questions that we've gotten over the last few weeks are about it. Um, what else you can look at in the data, and it's useful to have the tool open for those questions. So this project is a collaboration between the U.S. Census Bureau and the Army Office of Economic and, Power and Manpower Analysis, uh, which is based uh, in West Point. Um, so OEMA, which is what that group is commonly called, is uh, principally responsible for um, 
workforce strategy and uh, talent management in the Army. And as part of that role, they have very detailed data on um, uh, U.S. Army soldiers. And we're going to use, we use that data in tandem with census data to, for, to develop these new statistics. So in designing these statistics, we um, looked at the available data um, on new veterans and you know, tried to think of what don't we actually know. Um, so we anticipate, sorry, what don't we actually know? What we don't actually know is we don't really have a very broad, um, detailed portrait of how veterans are doing in the civilian labor force once they leave the Army, both um, short run and long run. So we're uncertain what their initial outcomes look like. And we are, um, there's very little on long run outcomes. And this data is to try and fill that void. So in addition to that broad picture of, of how veterans are doing in the labor market, we anticipate some narrower use cases for the data. The first is the military. So obviously we're working with OEMA uh, to develop the statistics. OEMA is very interested um, not just in understanding how veterans are doing, which is something they do want to know, um, but also talent retention and recruitment. Um, they're very worried about losing um, skilled service members to the private sector. Uh, they want some information on uh, which occupations there is a substantial private sector demand. And you can anticipate that uh, data on veterans' outcomes in the civilian labor market would be used as a recruiting tool. Um, for the Army. So you could see this is the kind of career you could have in the Army. And look, there's private sector demand uh, for this kind of job experience. Here's how these uh, um, former Army soldiers do once they're in the private sector. Similarly, we imagine that soldiers and veterans themselves are going to want to use this data uh, for planning post-military career transitions. And I'm going to walk through a specific example of how you can use the data to do that. And lastly, we anticipate that policymakers are going to be uh, interested in these statistics. Um, veterans, there's a lot of interest in uh, how veterans are transitioning into the labor market and, and many programs that are there available to help veterans with these transitions. And those prog programs lack a, a lot of data. So, what specifically is available in the statistics? Um, so we provide, VEO data provides very detailed earnings outcomes by military occupation, uh, civilian industry of employment, and detailed ver veterans characteristics. Uh, ideally, we wanted to create statistics by what are called military occupation specialties. Uh, that's uh, the most detailed level of occupation data. Uh, that proved too challenging from a disclosure um, protection perspective. So we did wind up having to aggregate occupations up. And the statistics are at uh, three, three digit uh, uh, DOD occupation codes, which is 56 occupation levels. And also for some of the other statistics, we aggregate up further to a nine occupation code level. So the data are longitudinal. Um, so we have both first year outcomes and five and 10 year outcomes. Uh, that's a we can do that because we're matching to a longitudinal database of jobs that we have at the Census Bureau. So we're able to see both immediate and long run outcomes. And lastly, I'm going to point out, because this is, these statistics are based off of administrative data linkages, um, it's a massive uh, sample. So we match. Um, over 650,000 veterans who left service between 2000 and 2015 to the jobs record data. So um, this is a huge sample of veterans. Uh, by comparison, um, the current population survey, which is an another source of data on veterans, for this cohort of veterans, they only have 650 
veterans in the CPS. So we have many, many times that. In order to make the data more useful to the public, we release with the data um, what we call the VEO Explorer data tool. And this is an application that allows users to build um, their own data visualizations and explore the data and see what's available. And I'm going to use some screen captures from uh, the VEO Explorer to walk through some specific examples. And this is going to be actually the bulk of the presentation, is just showing you what you can actually do with the data, which I find is much more interesting than uh, just describing the data. So I'm going to walk through three use cases. Uh, one is the military use case. In, in particular, we're going to look at um, how cyber personnel, uh, what types of uh, private sector salaries private uh, cyber personnel in the Army earn in, the, in, in civilian jobs. And we're going to walk through the soldier case in which a um, former soldier is looking at the, veter at the VEO data to anticipate what kind of career path they might have after service. And lastly, we're going to look at a policymaker example. And specifically, um, we're going to look at the first year outcomes data to see if we can identify what types of veterans are really struggling uh, to find good work when they leave military service. So the first example um, is cyber personnel in the Army. So um, the U.S. Army is, is quite concerned about their ability to retain, much like the government sector in general, is very concerned about their ability to retain um, uh, high-tech uh, personnel, uh, which do which there tends to be a fair bit of, of private sector demand. So in this example, we're going to look at the data and see, uh, look up per certain cyber occupations in the Army and see how they do in the private sector. So one of the nice features of the VEO application is, as I mentioned, um, the data are not at the MOS level. They're aggregated up for, uh, to, to protect privacy of soldiers. Um, but you can type in uh, MOS codes, and it will point you to those aggregations. So I'm going to do that here in this example. I'm going to start typing cyber. And it's going to um, pull up a menu, and I'm going to see Cyberspace Operations General. And I'm going to go ahead and select that occupation. Electronic Warfare Specialist is also uh, considered part of um, the suite of cyber jobs in the Army. So I start typing that second, and it points me to this larger occupation group, which is called Intercept Operators. Uh, this is a lot of um, electronic intelligence and signals intelligence uh, occupations. And so I'm going to go ahead and select those, this occupation group, and then I'm going to remove the default occupations, and that's going to give me um, this selection right here. So these are first year private sector annual earnings for uh, these two cyber occupations, um, both at the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile. So as you can see, um, these veterans do very well in the private sector. Just to benchmark what you're looking at, the average um, uh, veteran uh, newly entering the labor market makes about $30,000 annually at the median. And you can see here that the, the median cyber uh, uh, former cyber personnel makes over $50,000. And at the 75th percentile, it's uh, closer to $80,000. So particularly for the more high-tech uh, and more experienced soldiers in this group, they probably are in that 75th percentile. Those probably are the soldiers that um, the Army is concerned about losing. And so if I were the Army and I were looking at this data, I would know that I would want to set my um, reenlistment incentives for these personnel uh, pretty high in order to be able to retain them because there are ample uh, well-paying uh, private sector opportunities for them. So I'm going to segue to the next user case, which is a soldier um, 
looking at uh, what sorts of jobs are available and what types of what kind of earnings they can expect when they leave service. And um, as a because it's the largest occupation group in the Army, I'm going to use the example of a, a former infantryman. Um, so my former infantryman wants to see what type of earnings he can earn uh, in different um, industries. So he's going to go ahead and um, actually get out of the detailed occupation uh, menu and go to occupation by industry here. And that's going to send him to this menu. So you'll notice for occupation, I've, I've selected infantry and gun crews. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and select five industries. Uh, it gets a little hard to read, more than five, but you can select up to 20 industries here. And uh, in my example, my infantryman doesn't, uh, he doesn't have a specific idea of where he wants to work. He just wants to know, uh, you know what different industries are paying someone like him. And so I'm going to go ahead and select construction, healthcare, uh, accommodation, food service, public administration, that's state and local government, and also the federal government. And um, my soldier is interested not just in what they'll earn immediately, but what kinds of industries are better uh, five and ten years after they leave service. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, instead of Looking at the distribution first year out, I'm going to go years post discharge and choose one, five, and ten years. And that's going to give me this screen. And these are the medians. So just to walk through what you're looking for at here. So the best paying sector of these five uh, for former infantry is the federal government. Um, I will say, because I've been browsing this data pretty uh, extensively for the last few months, this the federal government is a is a high, one of the higher paying destinations for most occupation groups from the Army. Um, many, uh, um, many former Army soldiers end up at DOD or the VA, also some at uh, Department of Homeland Security, um, and these tend to be uh, better paying jobs uh, relative to other sectors for um, most military specialties. The next highest paying is um, public administration. So that's state and local government. And um, if that's surprising to you because you don't tend to think of uh, former infantry uh, working in uh, local governments, uh, keep in mind that law enforcement is one of the largest occupation groups in um, state and local government. And indeed, a great many of these jobs are law enforcement jobs. Um, construction uh, is the third ranked accommodation and food service. Um, that's not surprising that those are pretty low paying jobs. I think we know that these are low paying jobs. Um, interestingly, when we were developing these statistics, there was a lot of interest in healthcare. Um, there's lots of groups that are interested in retooling former uh, soldiers to work in either high tech or healthcare where there are a lot of good paying jobs, but we don't generally see in the data that former soldiers get very good, health, uh, very well paying healthcare jobs. Um, and you can see here it's not a particularly good outcome. So my soldier is interested not just in what are the better paying sectors, but uh, which ones um, are the most um, likely to hire them. So you can also look at the counts. And this will give you the frequency of the number of veterans. Um, so this is former infantry who left uh, the Army between 2000 and 2003. You can look at other cohorts as well. But I want the 10-year outcome, so I'm looking at an a earlier cohort. You can see that first year out, um, there's a lot of uh, former infantry and construction. That declines pretty steadily. Uh, those weren't uh, some they weren't some of the better paying jobs, so it's not entirely surprising that we see veterans moving out of that industry over time. Um, many of them are moving more into these federal government and public administration jobs. Um, and fortunately, accommodation and food service, that was a pretty bad paying sector. And you can see there's declining uh, numbers of veterans working in them. So 
the good news here for my veteran is that those two of those better paying sectors, public administration and the federal government, are also um, a higher a, a good many former infantry. So I've been using the he pronoun, but of course, not all former infantry are, are men. Um, and so if I am a female, former female soldier, I might wonder, well, all right, how, you know, do these earnings reflect what I can in fact earn in the labor market? So I'm going to look at the data by gender. And that's going to give me this graph here. So this is a little different than the bar charts, so I'm going to walk through a little slowly what you're looking at. So the x-axis here is comparing uh, groups of veterans that left service at different times. So the first dot is veterans that left between 2000 and 2001. The last dot is veterans who left between 2014 and 2015. And then it's uh, the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile of earnings. Uh, blue is men, orange is women. And the big takeaway from this graph is that for m in most cohorts, men do earn more than women, but these distributions overlap uh, significantly. So at the 75th percentile, women earn mo much more than the median uh, male soldier. This earnings gap disappears entirely in the Great Recession. You can see those dots come together. That's not entirely surprising given what we know um, when, about the Great Recession, uh, which disproportionately uh, impacted jo uh, high-paying jobs in male-dominated industries. So um, it's, it, you see that gender gap disappear for those cohorts and then it reappears again in the economic recovery. The last example I'm going to walk through is, is the policymaker example where um, we're interested in understanding um, what types of veterans are really struggling to find jobs and to find good paying jobs in the labor market when they leave service. And um, similar to the last graph I showed you, in this graph I'm going to compare uh, different cohorts of veterans that left at different times and the share of them that found stable employment in their first year. The question I'm interested in here is uh, how badly did the Great Recession impact um, the ability of new veterans to find work? And what this graph tells me is that it mattered quite a bit. Um, so when you look at the 2000-2001 cohort, 60% uh, of them left service. 60% uh, of them when they left service were able to find a stable job their first year out. And by stable I mean they were employed more than half the year and earned at least a full-time minimum wage salary. So it's a pretty low threshold. Um, but you can see that it actually declines over time quite a bit. Um, the 2008 to 2011 uh, groups of exiters only uh, just over 35% of them found um, steady work their first year out. When we first looked at this data, we wondered if um, part of this was composition effects, different types of veterans leaving at different times. Um, so here you see we've segmented the, the um, data by education at entry into the Army. And you can see that this effect, there's some level shifts um, depending on how much education you had coming into the labor market, but this uh, uh, increased difficulty in finding stable work is across all co co cohorts. And no matter what way we segment the data, we see the same pattern. Our next question was, are there particular occupations that are struggling, military occupations that are struggling to find work in the civilian labor market? And the the theory that underlies this query is that many people have speculated that former combat um, personnel have a particularly hard time transitioning into the civilian labor market because of their training. Um, there's, a mismatch, there's more mismatch between their training and skills and what the civilian labor market employers are demanding. And so here we look at um, 
median earnings upon entry in the labor market. This is first year annual earnings by occupation. And you can see some support for that theory here. So the highest paying occupations first year out are healthcare, electronic equipment repair, um, communications and intelligence, and mechanical equipment repair. So these are largely non-combat occupations, and it's not um, hard to imagine how uh, a former soldier who worked in one of these groups and had these skills might be able to market themselves for a private sector job. The, um, in, uh, the occupation with the worst outcomes is infantry. Um, and uh, that is consistent with this notion that these soldiers are struggling more to transition their experience into the civilian labor market. This is particularly worrying because infantry um, is such a large occupation group in the Army. That's uh, what the figure on the right is showing you, is just the share of veterans by these occupation groups. And you can see that infantry is the largest. Um, so that, uh, uh, that's the end of the specific use case walkthroughs. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the data availability and, and our update schedule. Um, so this data was released to the public two weeks ago yesterday on May 5th. Um, you can Google it um, and start playing around with it. As soon as we get off this uh, webinar, um, it is now publicly available. Um, so right now the data is available for veterans for the U.S. Army who were released between 2000 and 2015. Um, and many people have asked, is this going to be regularly updated? And could it be expanded to cover other branches, other service branches? Um, both of those questions are conditional on demand. So this is, a, this is an experimental data product. Um, experimental data products are released to the public to see if they have legs and a uh, engaged user community. So um, we're trying to get the word out about these data. And if there is strong interest in continuing them, they could become regularly updated. That's also, of course, up to the Army continuing their relationship with us. So far, however, they've been pretty enthusiastic about the data. So. Um, I, we're right now not anticipating that that might be an obstacle. Um, and of course, if there's interest from other military partners, we would be able to expand these statistics to other military branches. So I'm going to segue to uh, um, the uh, question and answer session. Um, and while, we, uh, while everybody considers what questions they want to ask, I'm going to quickly show you uh, how to find the data. Always a useful part of the talk, I find. If you're looking for the Veterans Employment Outcomes, you can just type it in. I'm going to type in Veterans Employment Outcomes Census. And you see I get this. Lovely little press release appears. I open the press release. It's going to tell me some lovely information about the data. And it will point you to two links. So this is the VO experimental page. This is where you can download the tables and read the documentation. Um, and also to the VEO Explorer tool. And that's what I'm going to open now for the uh, live demo. Many of the questions that we have gotten over the last few weeks while we've been um, showing these new statistics to various groups um, is what other data is available. And uh, I find for these questions it's helpful to, to have it out because there is, I've shown you really only a sample of what you can query. So military specialization, you can do this by uh, rank. You can do this by industry. I showed you that um, service characteristic. Um, uh, this is an aptitude test that all Army uh, soldiers take upon entry, years of service, uh, rank at service, occupation by pay grade, um, demographics. We've got age, sex, race, ethnicity, and education level and enlistment. Um, there's going to be, right now all the data is national. 
there is going to be um, state level data released right now. Um, that data is uh, being reviewed by the um, state partners that provide the jobs level data. When they've finished uh, previewing the data, we will release it to the public. Um, so that tab will appear soon. Right now there's just industry. Erica? Yes. One of the questions that came through was regarding rank. And if that, uh, let me read the question. The question is, are these, are these data for enlisted, officer, warrant, or combined? Ah, very good question. So these are enlisted Army veterans only. Um, uh, ranks uh, E1 through E9, if you are uh, a former Army yourself or conversant in those rank levels. We looked at releasing statistics for officers, but um, not that many officers leave the Army, not enough to create this ki these kinds of detailed statistics. So we stuck to enlisted uh, personnel only. But you can look at outcomes by um, enlisted rank. So here's Staff Sergeant. These are their uh, outcomes. Sergeant. Corporal, specialist, this is the largest group of veterans leaving the Army. Most people make it past private. Uh, the ones that don't, uh, you can see they, they don't tend to do particularly well. So yes, you can look at their earnings. That's the 50th percentile. Uh, there's the 75th. Um, you see this weird bump in earnings in the Great Recession. Um, that's uh, uh, because many few of them are getting jobs that the selection on getting employed, the ones that are getting jobs are, are, are getting higher paying jobs. And then you can also look at the counts. Here's the employed count. As I said, corporal specialist is the largest group. And you can also look at not employed. You can see that spike. This is where the, uh, the years of increased difficulty getting a job. Another question is, um, can this be broken down by geography? As we all know, geography makes a difference on what salary is available. So right now, um, the, the earnings, back to earnings here, um, these earnings are all real earnings deflated by a national um, CPI. Uh, this question comes up a fair bit. It's possible that we could, that we do know where they're working. Um, and one thing we are exploring is uh, deflators that would adjust for cost of living in the place that the uh, veteran works. Um, we're conducting research into that now. Um, it's not uncontroversial uh, to use these types of deflators, uh, unlike the, the national CPI. Um, there's different versions of the deflators. There's, uh, um, there's, a, a, there's concerns that some of these uh, premiums are really reflecting that um, it's high, higher paying employers locate in cities in part because they are high, uh, higher profitable firms and are, are employing higher able workers. So it's, it's not always just cost of living. So, it's something we're looking into, though, and this question does come up a lot. Are you, are you ready to take uh, phone calls, sure. Erica? Okay. So, Operator, we're um, ready to take phone calls. Absolutely. If you would like to ask a question, press star 1 from your phone, unmute your line, and record your first name clearly when prompted. If you would like to withdraw your question, you can press star 2. Our first question comes from Martin. Your line is now open. Um, yes. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, I want to say that as a former Marine infantry infantryman, I'm delighted that your oh, example yeah. dealt with, uh, you know, infantry soldiers in your example's case. Um, one of the things that we've seen here, especially in the city of Detroit, is that the characterization of service of the veterans has been an issue with veterans getting into those uh, two top uh, industries that you mentioned, 
of federal employment and of uh, public administration. <clears throat> and we know now that DOD is now able to be uh, sued directly um, by veterans for bad uh, paper discharges and bad conduct discharges. Since we know that to be true, that a lot of mistakes by the various branches have been made in improperly discharging individuals, what is your data doing to reflect those individuals who may have been discharged improperly, and what remedies are we offering uh, for those who, once they're able to be uh, vindicated, uh, how are they able to rectify and then backtrack with our assistance to get into those uh, top industries of federal government and public administration? One moment. It looks like Eric's line has dropped. One second. So while we're waiting for Erica, I just want to um, request that the questions pertain to the presentation. And if everyone could just ask, ask one question with a follow-up question. Sorry, I'm back. I got disconnected. Welcome back. Okay. Did you hear his question? Does he need to repeat it? Um, if you, Erlene, if you could summarize the question for me, I'll have to happily answer it. Yes, I did miss it, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. It was a very high, high um, tech question, so I, I'm sorry. Marty, would you please repeat? Okay. Uh, I'll be fine. Um, just say one of the things that we have seen here, in particular where I'm from in the city of Detroit, Michigan, uh, that there have been veterans who have been discharged improperly as we know from uh, the DOD lawsuit that is currently going on now for veterans to be able to sue the Department of Defense directly for improper discharges. I noticed from your own data that the two highest industries were federal government employment and public administration employment. But if veterans are having adverse discharges once they get out of the service, they're not even in the runnings for these jobs. So my question was, what is your company doing to reflect this demographic of veterans, and what can be done? Are there any ideas or any um, resources out there that can be done to help expedite some of these discharges to be upgraded properly so that our veterans can find gainful employment? Because a lot of the mitigating circumstances have been PTSD and other things. So what do we, you know, does your data reflect that? And are there any resources yeah. out there to help yeah. with that? So. We did look at, into stratifying the data by um, type of discharge, uh, but um, uh, it proved infeasible because uh, um, uh, uh, discharges that were not honorable, standard honorable discharges, were actually uh, pretty infrequent in the statistics. Um, we are planning to look at them separately in some of the research that's coming out. Um, from this uh, uh, collaboration with the U.S. Army. That research is unfortunately right now on hold because the, our Army um, co-authors can no longer access the data since uh, we all went uh, stay at home for co because of COVID. Um, but it is something we're planning to look at. I did pull up really quickly. Um, so this is, um, this is first these are the industry outcomes um, for the most common industries that former infantry, which is the largest group of veterans, end up in after service. Um, so the, a lot of those um, public administration jobs uh, are something that you do segment to later. Um, so I didn't want to leave the impression that those are the most common first year um, jobs for uh, former vets. These are the the, um, the four most, uh, sorry, four most common industries. Um, I agree with you. It's a it's a concern if if veterans are getting um, discharged inappropriately, um, and it's definitely, you know, of of concern to policymakers. And we are going to take a look at this in in the research. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from, I believe it was Steve at... Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I had a question that uh, as I just heard that a veteran could be given 
um, his salary as 50,000, different categories and all that, right? Now, my question was that being a veteran, they have um, special um, extra um, benefits, which is much more than the regular benefits given to an employee in that organization. So when it was mentioned in the presentation that a veteran could get 50000 now is it all inclusive of all the benefits or it can just um, go pay? That is my question. That, you know, yeah, when yes. you talk of the benefits, sorry, when you talk of the pay, it should be inclusive of the benefits as well as the pay, even if they are not too well qualified for the job. So the earnings that you see in these data are wage and salary earnings that include bonuses but do not include any um, veterans benefits, any GI benefits, any health insurance benefits provided by the employer. All that type of compensation is, is not included in these. This is uh, uh, wage and salary only. Any reason, uh, that's, why, it's not, any reason why it's not uh, included? And, and, yes. Um, so we're working with the, um, the Army Personnel Office. We have extremely detailed information on the veterans in service. But once they leave service, um, it's much harder to get longitudinal information on them. And so really what we have is their employment history and their earnings um, and where they're living and working. Um, so we don't, we don't tend to know what other kinds of benefits they're receiving. Um, in, the, um, in our bifurcated administrative world, that's because most of that data is with the VA. So we're, we don't have the VA data, so we can't track it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Jack. Your line is now open. Terrific. Uh, good afternoon. I, I arrived late on the presentation. I was reviewing my email and I saw it, so I got in as fast as I could. The question I have is: I'm a I'm an independent contractor with a company that's expanding, and I'm looking for people who may want to supplement their current income. Is there an avenue for them to pursue to to get in touch with me, perhaps? I can't think of a way to use this data for those ends. Okay. Um, yeah. We um, we are. I'll just mention that we do have a separate project uh, where we're looking at um, uh, um, moonlighting jobs, yeah. gig economy jobs, and and trying to see how extensive use of those jobs are in certain populations. Um, but that work's really just beginning. How about? Uh the company I'm working with, we we have uh, ex-military, and uh, and one of them is doing really well, and he used to drive a tank. That's how he does a presentation. That's how he opens it up, basically. What would his rank have been as as a tank commander? Uh, like a warrant know, officer? Or? It varies, or, and uh, I can't be, claim to be. Um, yeah, I might I might just Google that or something along those lines. Are you folks familiar with Primerica Financial Services at all? No, I'm afraid I'm not. Okay, because I know we're 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 doing webinars ourselves all over the country, looking for people that are that are looking for an opportunity to work with us. Yeah, so we're Thanks we're so trying much for to, your question. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ted. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks. Um, appreciate the uh, infantry question. Um, and this question comes from my personal experience. Uh, did you account for veterans who opted to return to school after service, but before entering the civilian labor force? Um, and how does that impact the results? So it's a very good question. Um, so. Uh, we know that veterans receive a good many GI benefits, um, but we can't actually see their utilization of that benefits in the data that we have. Um, when we saw the drop in employment rates in the Great Recession, um, one, one culprit we thought of was the um, post-9-11 GI Bill passed in 2009, which did increase 
uh, educational benefits for veterans, and there is an uptick in spending on uh, uh, GI Bill uh, benefits in those years. Um, but it doesn't seem to account for most of the decline in the employment rate because the decline persists even five years after the veteran has left service. So um, presumably most of um, them would have completed that education within five years after leaving service and, and we, still don't, we still see a big gap um, in their propensity to be employed. So it doesn't seem to fully explain some of the dynamics. Okay. Uh, let um, me follow up real quickly. Um, while that's probably the case for folks getting uh, a two-year degree that they would be hopefully done uh, at four years um, for uh, people trying to get a bachelor's degree, um, it's usually at least six. Um, and if you look at iPads, uh, that'll give you some additional information on that. So I wouldn't stop looking at five years, basically. Um, it might be a, a bit beyond uh, that. So uh, any event, that's my question and follow-up. Thanks. Yeah. So, I, so I'm, I briefly pulled up here another experimental data product that Census is working on. Uh, called post-secondary employment outcomes, and, and this is very similar to what you've just been looking at, except here we're linking um, student transcript data by um, at, to their jobs after school. Um, so you can look at different earnings for different types of degrees from different institutions and compare them. And our hope is, as the coverage of this uh, of these statistics expands. Um, we will actually be able to longitudinally link the veterans to their subsequent education and their workforce experience. Um, so right now we can't do that. The coverage of, the, of this data isn't large enough, but it, it, it's possible for a future date. Thanks. Interesting uh, new work. Our next question comes from Marion Key. Your line is now open. Hi. It's, um, my name is Mario. Um, I'm not a veteran. I'm on a board of a um, not-for-profit that helps veterans transition, also houses a VBOC. I know, um, thank you for your presentation. I know it would be extremely difficult to track, um, but I'm wondering, is there some consideration in the future to trying to statistically determine um, the various programs that are hodgepodge throughout the country that are um, to assist uh, the veterans. For example, I know of a platform in the, I'm from upstate New York, a platform that tries to um, coordinate MOS with uh, employers who are looking for employees. So um, it would be helpful, I think, if there was some understa or better understanding as to whether some of these efforts um, or have some efficacy and are helpful? That's my question, and, and thank you again for your time. No, it's a very interesting question. So um, the jobs microdata that underlies the VEO statistics that we've been talking about today um, is available for researchers in the Census um, Federal Research Data Centers. And what you can do is you can bring in your program level data and um, link it. it. It gets anonymized. The jobs data is also anonymized. Um, and you get a microdata file that you can link and look at um, outcomes for uh, the treated veteran population in your program. Um, at the state level, some programs already do this. Um, the advantage here is that this date, uh, the jobs data we have is national. Um, so that that so seems that like a potentially amazing tool <laughs> that you that you mentioned, um, keeping track of the microdata. Uh, wow, uh, I didn't even think of that. No, no, this is um, uh, the the micro 
data here is part of a larger federal effort to um, build a better infrastructure for this kind of data-driven decision making. Right. So the more people who participate, the more um, valuable um, you know, uh, the, the information is. Thank you. Our next question comes from Martha. Your line is now open. Hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity, um, and I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, my question reflects directly to uh, your data uh, that uh, you have collected um, in conjunction with the Army. I am a, a veteran. I served in the Army. I was in the Army for eight years. I went in, in from a professional um, environment, decided to uh, serve as an enlisted, uh, ETS out of the system in 2014 um, and acquired my master's degree in public administration and I currently serve uh, in the census uh, uh, with the 2020 census uh, operation. Um, my question is directly uh, in conjunction with the data. Is this data comprised only of active duty soldiers or is it all inclusive of active and the reservist components? It's just active duty. We don't have the okay. reservist data. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Our next question comes from Blewis County Small Business Development Center. Your line is now open. Hello. This is Tony, and uh, I'm a vet. I have also hired lots of vets and have recruited vets, and I really like the data here. Um, I stumbled across it because I subscribed to the census, so I got the email and noticed it. So I'm just asking, how can we proactively help you get this information into the right hands of recruiters in the DOL? I think this is great information, and I think we can really help you out getting the vets hired in. Uh, so thank you so much for the offer. Um, these statistics will um, uh, are really quite dependent on interest and, and use uh, to be continued. Otherwise, this will be the, um, the only release. Um, we have spoken to the VETS group at DOL um, as part of our uh, series of briefings that we conducted over the last few weeks. Uh, they were highly interested in the data. Um, we have been trying to get word out um, to other groups that work with veterans, but I will say this, we are a very small research shop at the Census Bureau. We don't have nearly the capacity to get word out we are reliant on um, all, all of you uh, who are interested in these statistics to um, show them wherever you think there might be interest. Um, so uh, I, I welcome all, sincerely welcome all efforts to do so. Okay, I guess my follow-up would be to everybody else listening, call your congressman and senator. Our next question comes Rebecca. from Jim. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Rebecca, I was just going to say that we're almost at 2.30, so we um, are going to allow two more questions, please. Our next question comes from Jim. Your line is now open. So my question is going to be with the tool, are we able to see uh, a person who exits the military uh, but doesn't go into the same occupation on the civilian side? So, yes. And I will say most do not go into the same occupation on the civilian side. Um, so even in pretty specialized occupations, so um, I'm going to, so medical care. Oh, actually, wait, let me do it by, uh, by industry. Um, you can even see for healthcare, oh, gr granted, oh, it, Zipped me back over. All right. Sorry. I was going to show you this, but apparently I've um, failed uh, my s selectivity. Um, so, um, when you look at healthcare specialists exiting the army, most of them don't even wind, most of them don't actually wind up in healthcare jobs. Um, and you can look at different occupation groups. It's just healthcare is sort of the easiest mapping of occupation to destination. Uh, and you see them going to all kinds of sectors.
it's really diverse. And there's a lot of uh, um, uh, qualitative data uh, on veteran surveys, and they, they do find that lots of veterans um, don't actually, you don't, you don't often don't have much choice over your occupation in the service. And so not surprisingly, a great many veterans are interested in a change when they get out. Um, so you can definitely see, that's actually I think one of the more interesting things of these statistics is you can really see the broad uh, diversity and outcomes of where people do end up. Um, and it is often you know, not doing something that's not as, um, not terribly related to what they were doing in the service in many cases. Our last question, I'm sorry, caller, your name was not recorded, but if you queued for question, your line is now open, please check your mute button. If you queued for question, please check your mute button, your line is now open. Okay, and that is all the questions, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon, and for those of you who are active duty and veterans, we thank you for your service. I'd also like to thank Erica for her presentation on Veterans Employment Outcomes. Join us next month on June 17 at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time when Andy Haight and I present COVID-19 Demographic and Economic Resources. Thank you, for your, thank you for your participation in today's conference. All parties may disconnect at this time.